I'm Alex. I've been in technical sales and marketing recruitment for about 15 years now, um, starting in the world of electronic components, uh, moving through to embedded and M2M, and my desk is now more focused on IoT. Um, it's such an ever-evolving market, which uh, really keeps me on my toes, and I get to engage with some really interesting companies and individuals across the space. Um, today's webinar is going to be the first in a series for the IoT sector that we're going to hold. Um, so we're going to be discussing what's happening now with IoT, um, the impact of COVID on the market, some key factors that might drive success in business um, and what the industry might look like in the coming years. Um, so to get you started, I'll introduce you to our panel and tell you a little bit about themselves. Um, Kevin, would you like to go first? Yes, uh, thanks for the introduction, Alex. Um, yeah, I'm Kevin Mayer. I work for um, SI, uh, an IoT connectivity provider. I've been in the cellular industry for Ooh, a long time now, uh, late 80s, so I am officially old. And um, I moved in, I was originally in the uh, radio network uh, planning, optimization and design, and I moved into M2M as it was, uh, probably about 11, 12 years ago. And then that evolved into IoT. I've, I've basically been in and around the IoT space since then. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, William, over to you. Thank you, hello everyone. Uh, so I'm William Webb. I have also been around for nearly 30 years in the telecoms industry, um, often as a consultant. But uh, back in 2011, I co-founded a company called Newell, which was developing a new wireless IoT technology called Weightless. Uh, and I then took over running the standards body uh, that was sort of spawned out of that. Uh, I ran that a few years ago. So I've had quite a detailed involvement in the IoT sector over the last 10 years. And indeed, uh, Earlier this year, I wrote a, a book sort of summarizing the last decade called uh, The IoT Myth that tries to explain what's happened in the last 10 years. And we could probably touch on some of the, the findings of that as we go through this event today. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, over to Abraham, if you'd like to go next. Hi, everyone. Abraham Joseph. Been around uh, M2M IoT for quite some time as well. I've been focusing on more or less IoT for the past 10 years or so. Prior to that, I uh, worked for Gartner, for British Telecom, Nortel, Alcatel. So all time teleco, ex teleco experience and more recently focusing on, on IoT and endpoints. So what I do now is I partner with organizations that want to be seen as the leader in a particular aspect of IoT, the cloud analytic sensors. I uh, do a lot of briefings, I get a lot of news, I publish news, do interesting interviews. So I'm more on, on the content side of things rather than on the technology side of things. Fantastic, thank you. And last but not least, David, over to you. Thanks, Alex, yeah. Um, so David Fouts jones um, again, a long time in telecoms, uh, starting businesses um, around device management and um, artificial intelligence. Uh, and then more recently spent a lot of time in um, in the world of IoT, specifically in LP1, and developing a company called Daisy. Um, and we are a deployment and device management and data management platform. Fantastic. Thank you so much, guys. It's really um, great to hear all of your backgrounds, and um, I'm sure we're set for a really good discussion today. Um, so to kick things off, I wanted to position the first question over to you, William, um, as it ties into some of the content of your book. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit of an open question, but why do you think market predictions for the future of IT might have been more inflated than the reality? Yeah, so... Uh, the, the classic IoT predictions were made back in 2010-2011 by Cisco and Ericsson uh, and, and at that time both of them came out and said by 2020 there's going to be 50 billion connected devices uh, and those predictions were quite widely reported and indeed that was the basis for a lot of activity, a lot of startups in that, in that space. Um, so here we are we're in 2020. Um, we, do we have 50 billion connected devices? Sadly not. I mean it's really hard to count but um, a company that um, I, I value quite highly called Transformer put out a survey recently and they estimated that there's about eight and a half billion connected devices. Now that's not a bad number, but it's, it's less than 20% of the predictions. And you know, I suspect that all the same mistakes being made 
for for the five G era in the, in the view that there's suddenly going to be a hockey stick takeoff and a dramatic increase in the number of connected devices. In fact, Transformer think that by 2030 we'll get to about 20 billion, um, so a doubling, which is not bad but not huge. So so why? Well, there's a lot of answers to that, but in a nutshell, it's much harder to sell IoT than it is to sell cellular. For cellular, you make a great iPhone, everyone turns up outside the store and you sell it. Um, sadly, cows don't trot along to the Apple iStore to have their connected collar fitted. You have to sell a complete system to, to farmers or verticals or whatever it might be. And that complete system sell turns out to be really quite difficult and to be really varied across a whole range of verticals. And I think that was underappreciated and it's still to some degree underappreciated the difficulty of doing that. And, and that, I think, is why a lot of predictions have been excessive in the past and might still be in the future. Perfect. Thank you. And, and following on from that, what do you think are some of the key factors to consider when it comes to monetizing IoT and becoming successful in a saturated market? David, I'll position that question with you if you'd be happy to answer. Yeah, I mean, um, coming back to um, as well points that William made um regarding the predictions uh, so, some of the challenges that i think the market has faced and any new market faces is is the way that the supply chain comes together and that's the i guess the main point of what william was saying we iot requires um you know some heavy lifting being done by the supply chain and at the moment i think there is still very much a wild west if you like with regards to the supply chain where people are not standardizing in a way that that will allow um iot to scale on on a massive level um and part of that is again coming back to this consumer proposition um that william touched on if you, you don't you can be apple uh, you can provide a very elegant integrated vertically integrated solution but um, unless all of your consumers look exactly the same and want exactly the same thing, then it isn't going to scale in the enterprise space. And, and I think that where vast volumes of IoT will start to, um, in the near term, start to play out, it will be in the enterprise. And they are looking for a, a supply chain that will operate in a scaled, in a scaled way. Um, specific to um, the key factors in monetizing IoT, uh, and I get that, I guess this again is positioned from an end and user's perspective or an end client's perspective. The, 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 the key is to think of IoT as an enabler of something. In my mind, um, IoT can automate business processes. It can improve efficiencies in business processes because of the volume and different types of data that can be introduced into those business decisions. Uh, that may mean that the decisions are made quicker or more effectively than they were before. And therefore, the key part of monetizing anything is to be really clear about what your business processes are in the first instance and what it would take if you were able to automate those to realize the ROIs um, that, that the IoT enablement should, in essence, deliver. And that, that, that typically, I mean, I'm a technologist, right? My, my past is building technology, but typically that is not a, a te technology issue. My experience today is now you're starting to see companies coming to market with really serious propositions, right? That can scale hugely and, and, and very elegantly integrate in lots of different ways. So the networks are starting to provide good coverage um, across, across um, not just here in the UK, but you know, very accessible global um, interconnect um, uh, solutions as well. So typically it isn't a technology issue. It's, for me, it's about making sure that the end client is very clear about what their business processes are and how they're going to um, get the ROI through the change that needs to happen in their organization. Perfect. And Kevin, I could see you uh, nodding away there, as with some others. Do you want to add anything into that as well? Yeah, I, th I think um, to cover uh, both William and uh, David's points, it, it is a long sale cycle. It's a solution sale. It's not like a, a um, selling stuff in the um, uh, consumer market. Uh, it involves a lot of stakeholders. It involves a lot of buy-in. It involves a lot of people being clear what it is they're trying to achieve. Because I think you know, to simply for a company to say, oh, I'm gonna embed IoT into my product and therefore I'm gonna make it a better product. 
it's not the case. You know, it's either, it's either to get an operational efficiency that they can get a, a demonstrable return on investment or, or to uh, move towards a service-based model where they can generate recurring revenue. But, you know, I think a lot, I've seen a lot of IoT projects kick off where the objectives are not clear. People don't really know what they're trying to get out of it. And I would say probably 70, 80% of the projects that I've seen failed. They've already failed before they start. Um, and it's through that lack of clarity of people, of the stakeholders being aligned and understanding what it is they're trying to get out of it. Um, and whilst you know, it, it involves a lot of moving parts, so a lot of the failures in that are down to the technology not being integrated properly uh, and, and delivering on that. So, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's getting better. I think we're learning as we go along. Uh, we've been through, I'm sure the rest of the panel have been in the same situation but we've been through an awful lot of paper proof of concepts there's a lot of stuff that's been learned there's a lot of stuff that um that we'd like to forget <laughs> but the more you learn and the more mistakes you make the better we get out of it perfect thank you so obviously you know there's no getting away from it uh covid's affected everybody in every sector um everywhere from work life home life everything um abraham how do you think um the pandemic has affected iot particularly as a whole um, actually, that's uh, quite a big, um, well, there are lots of parts to that. I'll give you a couple of examples. I recently did an interview with um, a gentleman who runs, a, who's got an insurance, a digital insurance company. And his answer to that is short term, lots of pain. Medium term, he sees that it's like a, an acceleration. And long term, he actually sees. Um, better benefits than uh, and a larger market than might have been there otherwise. Uh, another example, in fact, it literally just came in about an hour ago. Um, one of our partners, um, it's called Sky Response. They provide uh, solutions for people who um, manage responses. So with all this IoT stuff we, we've got, so we do all kinds of stuff, we do all kinds of remote sensing, but there are classes of applications which at the end of the day, somebody needs to go do something. Somebody needs to jump in a fire truck to go put out a, put out a fire, or somebody needs to uh, jump in a, in a car to go pick someone up who's fallen or whatever. And that's what they do. Um, so in his case, what's happened is that a lot of the partners, especially with care homes, they, they're in Sweden. They've lots, got a lot of opportunities, but they can't actually go in and install them right now. So depending on which sector you're in um, and depending on, on which part of the IoT ecosystem you're in, you may either be seeing um, increased opportunities or you may be seeing um, uh, delayed opportunities. Uh, but I think long term, and, and there's been quite a bit of research on this, um, it's likely to be possibly larger than it would otherwise have been. I think. Classic example, um, if we look even into the intermediate term, uh, we'd need to roll out a lot of vaccines and some of these require cold storage and so on and so on. So clearly there's going to be need to track and trace. And so one can see that even before IoT is, is, is over, as it were, there'd be quite a lot of opportunities, especially with tracking, tracing, cold chain, logistics, tracking people, etc. cetera. Um, there are lots of other examples I, I can think of, but maybe we elaborate on those a little bit later. Perfect. Does anybody else want to get involved? I mean, I know um, I, I sit from a different side. I sit, you know, towards the companies that are looking to recruit in this space. And, um, you know, I've got some that are doing extremely well. I've got more inquiries than they've ever had and stuff rolling out. And, and others that are saying, you know, they're there, the request that we can't do anything with it because the customers don't know when they're going to kickstart this project or be able to have people there to implement it. Um, you know, do you guys think there's a particular kind of turnaround in terms of some companies thinking more about how they're going to adopt IoT in the future? Has it prompted them to look at it earlier because, you know, we're looking at more connected devices, people being there because of the remoteness of, of COVID ensuing? I don't know, Kevin, if you want to get involved and um, uh, share some thoughts. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting going back to when this all kind of kicked off February, March times time frame. Things went off a cliff, I, I thought. Um, it just, everybody was panicking, projects were getting put on hold. 
and understandable in many ways. The companies didn't really know what the future held, how long this is going to be. But as the months went on, and I think people started to realize, well, this is probably something we're going to have to live with for a while. So we can't we can live in paralysis forever. I've seen quite a, a quite a swift uptake again in projects. A lot of and, and for a number of different reasons. I think in some cases because it's it's easier to access people in within companies now because they you know they, they've got a little bit more time on their hands. They're not commuting into the office every day. Um, they've got time to focus on projects that they had put on hold. Uh, other companies that are you know thinking uh, being innovative, thinking well, what is the opportunity for this within you know uh, um, solutions that are already out there. In fact, uh, take some sort of smart building solutions, air uh, quality, temperature, humidity monitors. You know, there's been some companies making some good business out of that and thinking, well, you know, we could repurpose this now. We could actually repurpose this for COVID and, you know, rather than reinvent the wheel here. So I think it is, it has dipped, it's stabilized and it's picking up as far as I can see. And I would, I would suggest that many companies I've talked to have seen a marginal hit on their revenues this year that they're expecting that to recoup next year. Perfect. David, have you found similar in terms of the spaces that you guys have been operating in? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think Kevin and Abraham have, have, have um, touched on all the main points. I mean, crisis hits and everyone just wants to survive, right? They just don't know where and to say, oh, but by deploying an IoT solution, um, it'll make you more efficient and save you money in the longer run. They look at that against, yeah, or I could just get rid of my office space. Um, you know and it's a fairly simple um decision so i think that's de to, to kevin's point that definitely meant that we 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 saw um frustratingly projects being postponed life goes on we know that this isn't going to disappear anytime soon and uh, businesses have to evolve um and and i th i would argue very strongly that uh, the best businesses will ad adapt uh, quickly and utilize technology to do that and um, I think IoT is going to be at the forefront of that change. And, and, and again, to Kevin and Abraham's point, we've, we're already starting to see more and more um, opportunities come through. Um, and so far as deployment is concerned, that was definitely an issue that we saw in, in the first couple of months of COVID. That, that's not an issue that we see today um in in the uk at least people are are able to access most places in a in a in a secure covid secure way um and i think on the last deployment we had uh three i think they were saying it was a three percent um issue rates so and 97 percent of of um the venues got act that they were able to access easily and and there were no issues uh, reported so it's, cha it's changed yeah, I think it's yeah, it can constantly change in landscape, isn't it? As people realise what needs to be done, you know, we've got to move through this. Um, William, for you, I mean, do you think that digital technology will be a crucial to our post-COVID nineteen economic recovery? Do you think that's going to play a huge part for our for our area? Um, you know, I I'm a great believer in in IoT long term. I think it it helps a lot with productivity. It allows all sorts of verticals and industries to do things better. You can imagine agriculture being more effective. You can imagine healthcare being delivered with far fewer hours spent in hospital or visits to people. So, so, so I think it is you know, really useful. Um, whether COVID actually changes it, I don't think it does. I mean, I think we still, it's still there. It's still needed to improve productivity. Um, and, and obviously we're gonna to need to, to grow the economy um, but I don't think it's sort of materially different. Um, just to pick up on the last question, one thing I do think hopefully has changed um, as a result of, of all the downsides of COVID is that some sectors that I used to look at and think, well, that sector is ripe for IoT, but it's just so risk averse, it's never going to embrace it. And healthcare was, was right at the top of that. You can imagine all sorts of IoT applications in healthcare, but trying to get the, a body like the NHS to adopt anything was almost impossible. But now, of course, it's realized that actually it can change. It can have remote GP appointments and they actually work. Um, and in fact, maybe there's other good things they can do quite quickly. So you know, I hope as a result, it might be much more amenable to, to looking at these things more quickly with 
less bureaucracy than it was in the past. And therefore, hopefully that will then feed through to, to all sorts of benefits, both in terms of productivity and in terms of healthcare in the future. Perfect. Yeah, I saw a um, PwC article about COVID driven technology investments, um, the healthcare, pharmaceutical, um, industrial man uh, manufacturing and transport were the most impacted sectors for people making those investments and, and turning things around. Do you think they'll be the fastest growing sectors for IT adoption, even after COVID for the next phase and the next phase? Or do you think the other areas will kind of you know, come forward with that. I, I don't mind who wants to answer that. I know I've to kind of thrown it out there as a follow-on, so. Let, let me have a go. I think there are definitely new opportunities and some industries being accelerated. Classic example is contactless. Um, not so long ago, lots of people started rolling out all kinds of um, touch surfaces, McDonald's, for example, going to a restaurant and people had iPads. Um, of course, in the age of COVID, all of this kind of stuff becomes very, very dangerous. Now, interestingly, there are some technologies on the horizon. Um, literally a couple of days ago, I was speaking to someone who um, has a solution that uh, potentially, if deployed at a, at a thin film level, can solve some of that problem. But until those types of technologies roll out, you can imagine that lots of things that previously involved touch, um, whether it be on buses, um, you know, at restaurants, you know, paying by card as opposed to, or paying by phone as opposed to. So there's definitely been a bump in, in, in some of those areas. Um, and I think, so, so, so some industries are being transformed. And then there are genuinely new opportunities. Um, I, I've seen, for example, the use of uh, robots and UV for, for cleaning. So instead of you needing people, an army of people to go into a plane to clean it, or go into locker rooms and so on, so, so definitely new opportunities are, are occurring, especially in areas like, um, as has been mentioned already, um, maybe home health, um, look, looking, after, uh, looking after people, whether it be uh, children or vulnerable people. Uh, so some of these um, probably new markets there, as well as some new applications, um, such as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, cleaning and various other um, less glamorous things that are now um, if you like, we know most, uh, com most countries are now actually, if you like, having a reevaluation of who, uh, who um, uh, the critical workers are and the critical roles uh, people play, whether it be garbage collection or whatever. So some of these lower tech things um, are getting a bit of a rebirth. And there, there are some interesting innovations in those areas. Definitely. Um, you know, I, I was super excited when we were back to working in the office. Um, we've got a massive office. We can social distance here. And the landlords, instead of the push exit button, we've now got a wave in front of the button to uh, to be able to open the door. So, um, uh, you know, I see it as a, an end consumer that's using these things as well that, um, you know, all of that side. So that was super exciting. Um, I know when I first started Working in this area of IoT, as it's called now, obviously I've seen the previous incumbents to it, um, that smart cities was a, a big buzzword. Smart cities was going to be the big next thing. Um, do, do you think, um, Kevin, that COVID-19 has opened the floodgates for smart cities to be looked at? Like we said, some of the you know less red tape and quicker deployment. Do you think we'll see a lot more of a, an uptake to it? So I know there's some... Um, cities globally that are, are far more advanced than maybe we here in the UK or Europe are, but do you think we're going to see a shift for more development on that side? It's a very good question. Uh, I've had some involvement in some, um, some smart city projects and I found them, generally speaking, quite problematic. You know, lots of different stakeholders involved. Uh, it quickly gets quite confusing. Um, I think with, with COVID, it'll certainly bring a sense of purpose that you know, something needs to be done now. Uh, to your point where you, you have uh, contactless uh, requirements in buildings now that are going to accelerate certain IoT solutions in, in that area, for example, that occupancy, monitoring air quality. You know, it, it, and there is no magic COVID detector. I wish there was, but you know, there are particle detectors out there, but, and they can detect particles that are the size of COVID, but they can't differentiate between COVID and something else. So whoever comes up with a COVID uh, detector is going to be a very rich person. But, uh, but there are lots of other things in, in the smart city domain that I think that will start to, to grow. I think it's, it, it's, it's, it's worth 
pointing out to the, a lot of these smart cities, they exist on paper. When you look under the bonnet and you really start seeing what some of these um, uh, companies that are big in smart cities uh, can actually do, it's very little. You know, it's a, a lot of it's aspirational and ideas. And, and But I do think um, COVID will accelerate certain aspects of the smart city uh, and, and put some focus on the areas that really will make a difference. They're not just like a, a pet project. Perfect. William, have you got anything to add on, on that topic? So I, I, I think you know, I, I agree very much with, with Kevin. Um, I, I'm actually a, an editor of a, a journal on smart cities, and there was a, a lovely provocative editorial that somebody wrote that basically said there are no smart cities. There's been there's been 200 plus trials, but they've all just faded back into to non-existence. And there's nothing that really looks like a smart city. There are cities with connected street lamps and and you know one or two connected car parking spaces or whatever, but not really what we envisaged of a kind of smart connected city. And I think Kevin's absolutely right. The issues there are just too many stakeholders, some of which are public sector, some of which are private sector, so quite different drivers and very difficult to communicate between them in any sensible way. And that still persists. And, and I think you know, what we'll see in response to COVID is some very immediate things that are obviously needed very quickly, um, some of which may actually not be helpful. So for example, um, if you decide it's really important to, to track where people are, in order to understand where there's a dense crowd of people and where they're more dispersed, then actually the quickest way to do that is just crowdsource that from their mobile phones. Um, and you, know, you could put in all sorts of sensors that measure it, but it was going to take quite some time. And you know, hopefully the pandemic will be over by the time those sensors are in place and, and up and running. And then if everyone thinks, well, actually, that's fine, we've got everything we need from mobile phone data, that reduces the driver for a smart city. So I can see it going, I can see it going either way, actually. Um, but I think there's some really fundamental problems with smart cities. Um, that need to be solved first in terms of finding ways that all the different stakeholders can somehow come together and realise something that brings value for all of them. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, we held a webinar on um, 5G and IoT um, a little while back in our GCS Connect series, and um, I think it came up in, in that conversation in terms of 5G and, and what it means for, you know, lots of areas um, and, and smart cities. And I think the, uh, the, you know, the conspiracy theories of 5G causing COVID and some very interesting yeah. topics. So, um, yeah, it's a, a really interesting one. Do you think... Obviously, with um, the kind of the five G rollout, that's going to help to be able to make things easier on the smart city side, or is it going to hinder it somewhat as well? So, so it's one of my bugbears. Actually, um, I'm not a, a great five G fan. Um, in fact, quite the contrary. Uh, so, in, in terms of, of IoT, five you know, G promises much, but actually delivers almost nothing. So, um, the five G IoT capability is, in fact, just the four G IoT capability. It's just taken narrowband IoT, which is a solution already available within 4G, already deployed by Vodafone in the UK, and simply said, well, that's going to be the 5G IoT solution. We'll call that 5G IoT. So it brings nothing new to the party. It may bring this sort of super low latency connectivity in a few years' time, but that's really going to be for, for specific in-building type applications, probably, and not for general connectivity. So, so it adds nothing to the puzzle, but it confuses people because they think there's something more there and, and they perhaps delay because they want to see it happening. So actually, sadly, I think on balance, 5G makes things worse rather than better for the smart city kind of connectivity where we would broadly be thinking of a lot of relatively low data rate, relatively simple kind of sensors distributed across the city. Perfect, David, I could see you nodding along there as well. So I guess you're, you're very much in agreement. Well, we, we've had um, some experience with smart cities um, as a deployment platform. And I think, I mean, I would say that um, everything the guys have said with regards to smart cities and then taking that through into 5G, um, you know, our, our experience pretty much rings true on that. I, I, I think I, I, I keep coming back to this when you look at the supply chain and the way that um, if you have councils, boroughs, whatever you want, um, as the end, end uh, customer of, of a smart city, if, if in, in the sense of how the supply chain will engage, they are selling into that environment. Um, you, you know, that's a big ask, right? That's, that's a lot of, uh, of consulting going on to figure out um, how the architecture of that platform, that deployment of that solution in, in its fullest extent needs to be 
um, needs to be delivered because, you know, one minute I'm measuring cars, the next minute I'm measuring NO2, the next minute I'm measuring particulates, the next minute I want to know when the street lights are on, I want to know occupancy levels up and down high streets, I want to know, you know, and if every time a council uh, looks to engage, they're getting bombarded with people who will offer vertically integrated solutions, I feel that's just slowing things up because that's just a bloody nightmare to scale that. Um, and what the, what we need to do is, is which I think is now starting to happen, frankly, um, you know, is to standardise a lot of the infrastructure stuff um, such that applications can just run on top of, of, of the um, infrastructure that's available. And then you really are calling out the experts, if you like, who add the value to say, right, what can what can you make of this data that's now coming out of these environments to, to, to then drive decision making and um, and better better lives, if you like, for for the for the um, people who live in these connected smart cities. As far as 5G goes, I, I couldn't agree more um, with what uh, Williams just said is it's it's um, it's a connectivity piece, um, nothing more, nothing less. I don't think a great deal from a smart city perspective is gained. I'm excluding, by the way, automated cars in this in this conversation. Um, but I don't think there's a lot that, that the latency uh, piece gives you in terms of um, whether or not there's a crowd of people in, in a high street or whether the lights turn on and, on and off. Um, um, I don't think uh, you, you gain much in terms of improvements in latency that the that these these solutions offer. Um, I, I would say it is a concern. The connectivity piece, full stop, is a concern with smart cities simply because if they truly do make their cities connected, there will be hundreds of thousands of devices on on these networks, um, if not millions, and you know that that racks up a bill, right? And when you're looking at some of the, um, you know, the tariffs from 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 the uh, connectivity providers, it starts to, you know, it, that starts to become a bit of a burden. So I think the which which, by the way, I'm sure will happen as we get more mature, the scaling of the opportunities will drive the prices down on, on the networks. But I do think the networks um, and the connectivity piece needs to be uh, looked at from a pure pricing point of view if you want to drive smart cities. But, yeah, that's our experience. Perfect. Thank you. I was going to say, I know it's one of those that I've, I've heard it come up and go away and come up and go away as I've been kind of working across this space as well. So uh, it, it's really interesting. Um, I saw another article um, that said um, COVID-19 was calculated to cause an 18% drop in net new IoT devices this year um, and fleet management and heavy transport vehicles being um, the hardest hit by the pandemic. Do you think that's more because these markets are not selling as much during the pandemic as opposed to the IoT adoption in those sectors? Um, Abraham or Kevin, do you want to uh, start with that? Uh, let me start, I'll just a little, just to back on the small cities. Um, so the small cities, I, I think, there is something valuable about um, tying together the transport, uh, home, energy management, um, et cetera, um, and if you like, making better use of what would have been disparate uh, data sets to deliver better value to citizens and so on and so on. Um, uh, but going forward, I think COVID may actually have a negative impact as people um, look at staying away from possibly public transport unless we manage to solve COVID in a sort of a conclusive way um, and more towards personal transport. A lot of what were previously thought of as smart city schemes may well need to be rethought. Um, in fact, there was quite a, a, an interest, a resurgence in scooters and all kinds of um, personal transport. So I think we could see a transformation of what was previously thought of smart cities. And as far as the 5G is concerned, I, I, I um, I tend to, I'm less um, bearish than William in the general sense, but as far as delivering value to IoT, I don't, I don't see there is any. I agree with William, there's no thing there. Um, so as far as devices are concerned, now that's interesting. I think in the short term, yes, because a lot of uh, you know, industries have just sort of collapsed. Um, but having said that, there are some areas where all the devices are occurring, right? Um, I just saw, uh, I forgot which, uh, I think they didn't give the name of the company. Um, but uh, this Israeli company is installing light fixtures 
And what they're now doing is enabling people to, to uh, companies to know when uh, the workers um, if you like are closer than two feet apart or whatever. So um, whether it be uh, re repackaging of existing devices or new devices, these devices are now being deployed in areas that are, if you like, helping mitigate or helping dealing with COVID. I'd let Kevin uh, uh, have a go now. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I'm not sure I agree with the, 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 um, the impact on, on uh, fleet management and heavy transport vehicles. I think there was a shift happening pre-COVID anyway, where you know, the supply chains and, and, and the, the, the movement of goods throughout that supply chain was starting to change in terms of people buying more online than they were in physical shops. And I think COVID for sure has accelerated that. And, and you could argue that a lot of um, uh, the retail industry that would suffer from this was probably going to suffer anyway. This just accelerated their demise. So, so I, I, I don't feel that those particular verticals have been and, and will be affected. I think the converse, actually, I think coming out of this now, the, 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 the whole business of smart logistics and, and managing supply chains, just, just considering, for example, the, the, the distribution of a vaccine alone, that's going to require cold chain monitoring. That vaccine's got to be shipped between a certain temperature, four to seven degrees or what have you. They, they, they have to check that the uh, shipments haven't been tampered with, so there's got to be anti-tamper, um, uh, capabilities within that, and if you just think of the logistical nightmare that we're going, the world is going to have of shipping that vaccine around every country, and, and how long that's going to take, and that's not going to happen in a month. That's going to take a long time, and I, I think IoT is going to be absolutely essential in making that work um, effectively. And just getting back to the point, five G, I agree with uh, everything that's been said. Five G does it help IoT? No, I think I think it will create a nice business for enterprise um, or companies that are selling into enterprise where they can use network slicing and virtualized aspects of the RAN to deliver individual services. But for IoT, no, I don't think so. We've got um, somebody in the, in the chat that came up, um, Tony Forrester, uh, basically agreeing that um, it's uh, a fantastical technology with few real world applications from that side of things. So uh, that, yeah, there's uh, people agreeing with us out there from that perspective, for sure. Um, in terms of, um, you know, looking at what IoT has, has done. Um, I think um, I, I saw a report, I can't remember exactly where it was from, um, but it highlighted how the overall size of the IT revenue opportunity for 2025 will be around the $900 billion mark, um, a 2.6 times increase on the 2020 figure. Um, and they factored in a contraction of $200 billion in IT revenue. But do you think that figure is realistic? I'll open it up to whoever wants to, to chip in from that side. I, I guess it, it depends how broadly you look. So um, you know, in the narrow sense might be just to say, well, well how much money are we going to get from connectivity alone? So you know, how much are Vodafone going to get from selling MBIOT services over the next few years? How much might... Um, uh, a Sigfox type company or a Laura type company get from, from selling services? And I think the answer there is, is not a lot, frankly. We're seeing, for example, SIM cards, MBIT SIM cards that, that last for 10 years and deliver enough data for a simple sensor for those 10 years that cost 10 euros. So that's, that's one euro a year. Um, so you need an awful lot of those to add up to, to the equivalent of even a small number of subscribers. So I, in that respect, I think it's quite narrow, I think, but as you broaden it and say, well, okay, if you include the modules, if you include the, the services, if you include the complete systems integration package, if you start to bundle other stuff in, then, then of course it, it potentially is a, a, a fairly big number. So I think it's important to kind of tie down what it is that's actually being, being talked about here. Yeah, I, I'd like to, add to, I would agree with that. I think connectivity um, you know, is, is, is a perceived commodity and the margins in that uh, are fairly are fairly low, but if you look at the whole um, the whole solution, uh, and there are many moving parts to that. There's a lot of money being made a, a, a across that value chain. Is that a is that a, a reasonable figure? Yeah, could be, could be. Yes, yeah, so Abram, I saw you nodding as well. Did you want to uh, to dive in as well? 
Yeah, I totally agree with William. It depends on what's being counted, right? Um, there is IT, there is OT, there is, uh, uh, it, depends on, it depends on what's, what's being counted, whether it's uh, services, modules, uh, integration. Um, in fact, I, I was just looking at some numbers earlier. I remember there was an 11 trillion figure, I think, was it in the McKinsey report not so long ago. Something just came across my desk saying something like 150 billion in 2019, rising to 244 billion by 2021. But of course, the key thing is what, ex what exactly are people measuring on the falling IoT? I've got a nice little dongle from Vodafone that I'm trying right now, which is you, know, you put it on your, your kid's backpack or you put it on your purse. Uh, I think they call it Curve or whatever, a new service that they're offering. Um, so even from within a Vodafone, you know, what, what are you measuring there, even if you do offer that service and how, and when you measure it against the, the, the assets and, uh, and the uh, deployments you already have, you know, what, what are the incrementals that you're measuring? Uh, so I think the challenge we face um, is this. Uh, in the old days, it's like networking was the prevailing paradigm and everybody wanted to be in network. So IoT will and is disappearing into the plumbing. So whatever, whatever business you're in, whatever industry you're in, and if you're any kind of if you're in IT in any shape or form, IoT forms part of, of, of what you do. Uh, some organizations like Cisco and Intel and so on that have attempted to sort of uh, draw ring fences around IoT. In fact, it was quite interesting for those of us who were looking at IoT to see what they were, what they were considering within that IoT pie. Um, so I think there are crazy numbers. Uh, the important thing is some of the points people were making earlier about uh, actual solving you know, real world problems using um, rather than being hung up about um, specific numbers. But it is helpful to break it within, to separate what might happen in a business to business context in an industrial IoT sense, factories, robotics, automation, whatever, and what might be happening in a, in a, in a sort of consumer sense. Um, and there may be some use in attempting to, uh, to dimension whether it be uh, services or capabilities or revenues along the Perfect. David, have you got any thoughts to add into uh, to this latest bit? Or? Um, I'd, 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 I'd be very happy with a slice of the 900 billion, right? <laughs> <laughs> as, 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 as long as Daisy makes up, you know, 20% of that, 50%, uh, I'm fine. Uh, no, as, as I say, I, I'd agree with what the guys have said. It, I look at these numbers. I, do, I don't, to be honest, I don't completely understand them because I don't know what, what they what they contain um is is the iot going to grow over the next five years yes <laughs> That's definitely what definitely so there's a question i want to ask to uh, each of you um in terms of um iot so what new iot solutions have you seen or heard about that could be really groundbreaking and make a difference kevin do you want to start yeah, there's, there's quite an interesting one I saw recently. Uh, Vodafone and Bayer announced a, um, a smart label. So you're starting to, to now get into the area of disposable and transactional IoT. And I think we've got some way to go yet in that, in that space. And I know quite a lot of LP1 um, um, companies are trying to come up with something in that, in that space, you know, something that um, is cheap. Uh, the bill of materials is cheap. It, it has very little requirements on batteries. Uh, and it's very simplistic and easy to use. And we're not there yet. I don't think we really are there yet, but we'll get there one day. But we're starting to see the seeds of that now coming through. And I think, you know, that's transformational. The ability to, you know, we can track, so let, let's take a, an envelope or a, a parcel that gets delivered to the home. You know, we can track the containers that, uh, that, that transport these things. We can, we can track the trolleys and cages that these letters and boxes sit inside. Um, and that, that's as far as we can take it. So, you know, it ends up somebody at your door handing you a parcel, usually one that you've got to keep for somebody else who's not in across the street. And, um, and they ask you to sign something. Um, and that's that. But the ability to be able to just, you know, barcode, uh, use a barcode scanner on that to say, yep, yeah, it's been shipped from, you know, from factory right through to Mr. Smith on, you know, or, or whatever. I think that's groundbreaking. And, and, and you know, putting those things on, 
luggage, for example, going through airports, the ability to track things to that level of granularity, I think is groundbreaking. Definitely, that would be amazing. Can you imagine not worrying about where your luggage is going to come off? You can know exactly where it is. Nothing's going to get lost or be delivered somewhere else. And um, yeah, I think the uh, it's uh, some of the stuff out there is really exciting. Um, David, same question to you. Yeah, so I guess my stuff is is a, is a little more boring than that. But I I, I think cause I th actually think this is where the volume plays happen as well, which is, you know. There's work that's already going on um, in enabling um, homes in social housing and uh, you know managed property uh, where they're looking to make tenants' lives better, um, both in terms of the quality of the uh, properties that people are living in, um, but also understanding more about um, the, the the tenants so they can make sure that they're in more appropriate um, housing. And and that's that. That to me is the is the the beauty of of IoT. The, the, um, I think Abraham's already already said the word which I use a lot, which is the plumbing thing. You know, we, we, the IoT is going to disappear into the background, and it is just the plumbing. And and really, where where this stuff takes off is when really um, smart people can uh, who understand their domain that real have real expertise on their domain, and they can start to say, right, we know. That this particular um, tenant is suffering with uh, from uh, you know with fuel poverty, and therefore the way we can um, address that is by ensuring that they're in a more appropriate place um, than than they are today, because you know we, they're simply going to continue to struggle, and you can change and transform someone's lives, uh, and and that it sounds quite um, you know. Uh, I don't know. It sounds almost American in the way that I'm saying it now, in terms of transforming people's lives. But that, but that is fundamentally what um, I think IoT used well can actually do, or data used well can actually do. And IoT is a part of, of of that. And there is a massive amount coming out. And we we are the only thing that stops us doing that. I think is just getting the supply chain right today. There's no there's no barrier as far as technology is concerned, as I can see it. Perfect. It leads really nicely into a question we've had on the Q&A from George. Um, it says, what does the panel think about the state of cybersecurity in IoT? Is it a barrier to growth? Yes, I think yes. it is. I mean, it doesn't need to be. So uh, it's, it's actually really simple to, to make this stuff really secure. And, you know, we've been making secure cellular networks for years. It's not difficult to, to design into to a technology standard and into... Uh, the implementation of the system, a security approach that is more than good enough at almost zero cost. Um, but the problem is it doesn't happen because there's a number of companies that, that don't do it or, or they don't follow best practice, you know, the absolute classic, they just leave the, 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 the four digit pin as zero, 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 and everyone just breaks into it. You know, lots of really stupid stuff happens and it could be fixed very easily. Um, but the problem is it does happen and then it gets a lot of publicity and that scares a lot of people who then think, you know, I would quite like a connected whatever for my house, but I'm worried that somebody might hack into it. Now, the chances of that might be incredibly small, but that worry is enough to stop people doing it. So I think we do have a we do have a problem. It's a problem that could be solved without too much difficulty if everyone adhered to best practice. But I don't know how you get everyone to do that, especially when they're distributed all around the world. Perfect. Has anybody got anything else to add? I think William answered that perfectly there, but. Yeah, yeah I, I just like that. And it's probably the number one question I get asked in most IoT projects: What are your security protocols? How secure is this? And, and to William's point, it is it's the fear the fear factor. What happens if something gets hacked? And it's the repercussions of that. You know, and it, it's disproportionate, I think. But I agree, it's 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 not rocket science to do this. Perfect, thank you. So another question that's come in, um, Abraham, perhaps you'd like to answer this one. Um, what is your opinion on the possibilities offered by the various IoT devices for consumers uh, in bracket smart home and how do you see the market for these devices? Okay, um, let me just uh, say a little bit on security before I get into the next one. Perfect. I'm talking with a company called Cybrus Labs. They won a two million uh, funding from the European Commission to work on IoT security. Um, of course, in the UK, we have a group called the IoT Security Foundation, and lots of companies doing lots of interesting things there. Um, 
it is a problem. As William said, the problem is, um, you know, the manufacturers rolling stuff out without much thought um, and a lot of things being done after the horse has bolted. And it does uh, slow down market adoption, absolutely. Um, but there are solutions out there. There's some very interesting things happening. Um, and uh, if anybody's in that space, by the way, um, I'm looking at something in that area right now. So by all means, uh, please contact me. Um, regarding the home, uh, it's very interesting, actually. Yesterday, I came off a, a conference call with a thread group. Um, so these guys are looking at, um, in fact, it was started by ARM and uh, Google and others, and a number of them have pulled away and uh, it's now being reformed. Um, and uh, people that are in the lighting space and so on are actually moving in. The, it's difficult to see how smaller companies are going to survive in that space. Um, Ultimately, it will be a big boys game, uh, Google, Amazon, Apple, and even before you start talking about the, um, you know, the, the consumer electronics guys, the, the, the Sony's and, and, and Samsung's, etc. Um, I think it's an interesting and vibrant market. I must admit I'm a bit of a Luddite. I don't um, have, a, I'm probably one of the few tech people, I guess, who doesn't have a, 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 um, one of these uh, listening devices. Uh, some people are very proud that they have them in the bedrooms and so on. I must admit I'm not that keen. I think there is a, a huge and and uh, a vibrant market there. There's lots of turbulence in the in, in the mid in the midterm. Partly, you know, various um, standards and you know, Zigbee, Z-Wave, Bluetooth LE. So it's a bit of a mess uh, at the moment. Um, standardization is happening by by force, I guess, um, by the big boys. Um, some nimble smaller players might be able to make a go of, of it in the, in the short term. Group uh, SNs from Israel. I've seen a lot of people do lots of interest in things in that space, lots of interest in capability. But even as a potential purchaser, when I see a nice device that would sit between my home and, for example, the internet, and instead of you know, 10 copies of antivirus for each PC, um, you know, something that can, if you like, act as a gateway. I'm still hesitant because I know that next year it's probably not going to be of any use to me. Um, so, so there is work to be done by those wanting to play in that space to, um, if you like, make a compelling case to the consumer and then um, deliver value for money. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I, the smart home has been around as a concept for what, 40 years now or something? Um, uh, every decade there's some new smart home demonstrator that takes place uh, and actually you know, we've got almost nowhere and I think what we're seeing is instead of people making the home smart is they're bringing smart stuff into the home so instead of having the infrastructure of the home connected so that your door lock is now connected and you know, everything else in the house is connected people are bringing in smart speakers and so on and, and that makes the home a bit smarter but the cost of actually changing the home is enormous. You know, you have to rewire stuff, you have to take out stuff and put in other different things. It's it's expensive, and and the benefits aren't necessarily that that huge. So it's much easier just to bring a smart speaker in and drop it down and and kind of say job done. Um, and and I don't see that changing that much in the future. I think it's really hard to make the case to somebody as to why a smart connected home lighting system will really benefit their lives more than. Uh, buying a few bottles of wine and having a nice takeaway. I, I agree. I, uh, I, it just reminds me of, of the smart kettle that was released and, and no idea why people would want a smart kettle. I've never been able to wrap my head around that, but, um, um, but thank you. I, David, have you got anything to add into the, the answer on that question? Yeah, I, th I guess only to say, um, I think there are, the, the point that uh, William just made is is, a re is an interesting one, which is um, you know you'd you'd ha you do have to invest a bit to get uh, the technology in, into your home and working well. I mean, there and, and the point that Abraham made in terms of Apple, Google, Amazon, it, it, you know these are the guys who understand the and have the ability to support and service the consumer on a global basis. That it's it, it's a big boys game. The thing I like about um, some of the solutions that I I've seen and work with with regards to smart homes is that they piggyback on events that are occurring in somebody's life so if i'm if i'm looking to um go uh, to a carbon neutral state for example with as far as my energy is concerned i'm putting a 
heat um, an air source heat pump or or a, or a solar panels or whatever it is in my environment and I'm looking to manage the heating system uh, more appropriately then yeah that the, there are there's um, some good tech out there that will help you do that in a really smart in a really smart way um, and I think also that it, it from, from a home perspective there are two clear markets I know the question was about consumers but you've got the consumer proposition probably pretty much everybody who's, who's listening to this call um, and then you've got the managed property guys who are managing 60 70 thousand homes um, or units um, you know for, for for companies and their their challenge is what they see when they look at the market at the moment is that again they're seeing these vertically integrated solutions that look great from a consumer point of view but for them they're just a nightmare to, to integrate they cost too much and um, they, they're, they're very difficult to scale in their environments. So they need they need those solutions split apart so that they get um, they can deploy devices independent of the applications that they want to run on top of the data they get from those devices, so that they can improve tenant um, tenant experience. Um, you know, helping tenants reduce their energy bills, helping tenants reduce their uh, water, and so on and so forth. They can do that in a highly scalable and cost effective way. Um, a consumer proposition at, at the moment, those don't tend to play very well in those in those managed property sort of more enterprise type propositions. Um, so that's what I would say on smart homes. Perfect. Um, so in terms of, I, I know I was asking a bit about some, um, you know, the, the really uh, groundbreaking um, IoT solutions that you might have heard about. Um, let's flip it on its head. Has anybody got one that they've heard about, like I mentioned with the IoT kettle a few years back that I, I couldn't believe was a real thing, that they've heard of that are going out there that are just not worth the investment and you wonder why people have ever decided to get involved. I'll open it to whoever wants to answer. I'll take that one. Um, I very recently, my fridge that I've had for 20 years just gave up the ghost. So my wife and I went to a famous national uh, department store to look at the fridges. And the guy was hell-bent and trying to sell me a smart fridge. And by smart, it had a panel on the front of the fridge that whenever you waved at it, it would, through cameras inside the fridge, give you a picture of what was inside the fridge. And I said, well, why don't I just open the door and have a look? You know, um, so that was quite interesting. And he, he could not sell the value of that thing to me. He said, yeah, would you be able to... Uh, uh, log in in your, your, your smartphone on an app when you're at work and see if you need any milk in the fridge. I said, really? Is it, you know, where's the value in that really? You know, Is my fridge going to try and tell me when it needs something? You know, yeah, cause it, it's just ridiculous, I think. So the smart fridge, I think, is my example of that. Although I'm not against connected appliances per se. I think when it comes to white goods, I can see a clear benefit to... Uh, Manufacturers moving towards a service-based model. You know, they can they can monitor their equipment remotely. They can detect through you know vibration, temperature, or what have you, if the condenser is going to go on a fridge or something like that, or the the motor is going to go on a washing machine, and 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 they can offer and tailor a service in and around that. So, so yeah, smart fridge from a consumer perspective, no, but from a uh, um, from that perspective of a service-based model, yes. <laughs> Excellent. Has anybody else got anything similar that they've heard of? Abraham, yeah? Um, well, two things. One is I think the chap didn't use his best argument on Kevin. He should have told him about uh, the rise in temperature and how much he's going to spend in energy each time he opens the fridge. Anyway, <laughs> that aside, um, not on the negative one, but on the positive one, a gentleman called Carsten Brunschulter, he started off in the device management area. And he's, he, his last, the last thing he did was he sold... Um, a, a, if you like, a, 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 a mobile network in a backpack to uh, Trulio, and he's now moved on to a solution for fighting fires. Um, so a mesh network deployed in the forest using solar power and being able to sense fires long before you see smoke. Because even the satellite-based solutions, uh, most solutions that exist de depend on seeing some kind of detect smoke before, um, and he's now got an interesting solution around that. I think that could be quite groundbreaking. At the moment, they're concentrating on forests, um, but I said to him, well, what about California? What about Australia? And uh, 
they seem they want to focus more on environmental impact rather than necessarily going for money. Uh, so I thought that was a that was a good one. But yes, I see lots of examples of uh, kettles and fridges and, and and various things like that. But um, I think uh, probably do do require a little bit more thought before people uh, bring them. Uh, I think we've seen some some trends and changes in a way. So if you go back to you know, the classic, used to be the consumer electronics show at Las Vegas. You you pitch up there. And there would be a hundred different ridiculous concepts, like a connected fork or connected toothbrush or you know whatever it might be. Everything you know, anything that was any kind of a physical pro product would be connected for no obvious reason. And happily, I think a lot of that's faded as people have realised that that that's not going to work. I think it's been replaced to some degree by the by the sort of five G stuff of you know remote surgery. Um, yeah, sure, somebody's going to be operating on my on my heart whilst they're walking down the street. You know, with their 5G phone in their hand, I don't think so. Um, no, that kind of thing it, it just seems you know, incredibly implausible. Yeah, and if it's going to happen, it's going to happen in a hospital where you've got a fiber optic connection. Frankly, it's not going to happen by someone walking down the street. So, so I think that's where this, you know, the, the, we've now transitioned to, we've moved away from the simple devices to the more complicated solution space, but there's still a lot of, of concepts that are really not well thought through. Perfect. David, have you got anything to add on some silliness that you might have, have seen or heard of in this space? I, I'm, uh, I, I live um, miles out in the country, so I'm, I'm a Luddite. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think Kevin's, uh, I can understand how that might have been challenging, um, you know, to make that sale. I didn't yeah, that. definitely. I think I fell foul to, uh, I needed a new tumble dryer. Mine had packed up. Um, the one I went for in the end um, was sold to me because it had a smart functionality in it and I can hold my phone and it will tell me what is wrong with the washing machine so that when I phone, they know exactly what parts or what service needs. So I have to say, however, it was no more than the other model I was looking at that didn't have the smart functionality. So, um, yeah, I think it just depends on who the audience is and, and, and what you want and uh, how much you want to show off with things, doesn't it? So um, we've got um, one final question that would be great to, to get in before we close this down that's come from um, Roy Barclay. He says, about 10 years ago, there was a lot of talk about power scavenging technologies, which would enable batteryless sensors. Um, two questions, one technical and one commercial. Has there much technical development in power scavenging tech? And are the use cases still there? I'll open up to whoever feels comfortable to answer one or both. Yeah, I can, I can pick that up. So, so firstly, hi, Maury. It's good to hear from you. Um, uh, so the short answer is, there hasn't been much technical development um, and there aren't that many use cases. So there is a company I know of called 8Power, the number eight, and then the word power, um, that specializes in this area. And they found a few very particular use cases that tend to be industrial machinery that vibrates and the, for some reason, you know, because just, just as a nature of what it does. And, and you can then capture that vibration enough to power a sensor. Um, so that one particular case is viable, uh, but I don't think there's anything new under the sun in terms of the way to harvest the power it's sort of fairly simple um, power harvesting device so you know, there's a very small element of that but i you know i agree 10 years ago there was a view that this was going to be the utopia to solving the battery problem for for low power low cost modules but actually there isn't really a way for most modules to harvest enough power even for their very low power consumption perfect thank you has anybody got anything else to add I actually came across several uh, companies recently um, looking at various forms of harvest harvesting, um, for example, pressing of switches and so on. Uh, one of the most interesting one was the, at a Parks uh, conference, uh, maybe about uh, mid last year. And it was attempting to actually harvest energy from, um, from the air, from electromagnetic. And they appeared to be able to do enough to be able to power some um, simple devices. Um, but as to how that scales and whether that, when that's going to be ready for market, if anybody's guessed. Um, but there seems to be a resurgence of interest in that area. I thought, I thought it was dead, actually. Like William said, it's been around and people have been talking about it for ages and so on. And then all of a sudden, they just, you know, I came across three or four companies in, in, in a very short space of time looking at um, kinetics, looking at um, you know, RF capture and all kinds of things. So somebody out there is, is probably funding some companies. 
Fantastic. So I really want to thank all of our panelists today. Um, I know, I, you know, we've picked a topic um, that that this sprouted from a conversation that Kevin and I were having, funny enough, and um, uh, kind of drove into that. That is so massive. You know, IoT has so many possibilities to it. Um, as we mentioned, it's the first of a series of webinars we'll do around IoT. Um, I think there will be a survey that will come up afterwards. So please, guys, you know, answer the survey and, and share your thoughts. Um, we also have a a LinkedIn group, our GCS Connect um, IoT, um, which I think Betty will put around in the chat for a, a link through to. Um, but Kevin, William, Abraham, David, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks everybody for watching. Um, I hope it's uh, been enjoyable.